Holy Gospel contains the text where Jesus announces the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. This is the text. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, fellow disciples of Concordia, we have just come from a Memorial Day weekend, and we have commemorated in that all those who have protected our constitutional liberties. The Department of Defense data simply says that since the Revolutionary War, over 1.3 million died securing these blessings of liberty. So in that light, and our appreciation for all of those who have given the ultimate sacrifice of freedom. Let's take a look at one of those rights that they died for that we might enjoy. They refer to the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The government cannot establish one religion over another. In our contemporary times, we have even come to realize the Constitution says you can't even prioritize religion itself over those who don't believe anything. Believers and non-believers in the eyes of the Constitution have equal rights. But it does guarantee the liberty of free exercise. We get to freely accept any religious belief that we are inspired to believe and then to engage in the proper religious rituals appropriate to that. We're protected. Okay. Now let's face another reality. Now this go back 10 years to some Pew research. But I doubt if they've changed in the last 10. The data show there were 70% of Americans to be Christians. 5% were other religions. 23% were the nuns that we all hear about now. Atheists, 3%. Agnostics, 4%. 16%, nothing in particular. Okay. Now we can drill down into that Christian. 70% of Americans. Of those, 36%, or 84 million, worship once a week. 33%, or 77 million, twice a month, or a few times a year. 30% or 70 million, seldom to never. I find that there is still 1%, well, I don't know. But does not this raise the question, if there is freedom to believe and practice religion, and we claim it to be so precious as to those who died that we might do it, can you explain to me why only 76, per, 76 million, 30% of Christians actually do it regularly. What the heck is going on? If liber civic liberty is so valuable, why do so few practice this spiritual freedom so irregularly, so infrequently, to even not at all? What is our witness? Let's just do a little comparison, shall we? If any American was to be so slapdash and haphazard in observing Memorial Day, we would wonder about their patriotic spirit. Or at least question how one could be so heartless and unappreciative in their attitude towards the, those who paid the ultimate price of freedom. We don't even take time out to remember them. What kind of American are we? 
That's dangerously close to saying only 30% of Christians actually celebrate a Sabbath and worship. Do the other 60% dare I say it? What kind of a Christian are you? But let's not be so hasty as to be pointing fingers, because as I pointed out before, I don't point it out, get the point. <laughs> you pointed somebody else and you got three pointing right back at you, right? God's incarnate word this morning in the gospel reveals the mystery of faith that is in his death and resurrection. That's the true mystery that enables any child of God to be spiritually free as to make every Sunday a Sabbath celebration of worship and to observe the joyous fireworks of hearing God's word and enjoying God's presence. I call them fireworks. These are pyrotechnics, what we are doing this morning. In terms of divine worship. So let's address the elephant in the room. Namely, there's got to be something about sinful nature's inclination still at work and even Christians to misuse God's own commands that we end up satisfying our selfish whims to fuel our egotistical impulses. All that means to say. Sabbath, by God's own definition, at least in the Deuteronomy text this morning, means do no work. Stop doing whatever regular toils you perform to make a living. God instructed Israel. And remember, by you not working at God's grace and merciful work for you, freeing you out of Egyptian slavery, you take time off. The old Adam and Eve in every human being takes that same do no work and says, well, God tells us we're supposed to take a break from the old grindstone. The Old Testament people were told to do that. We even got the third commandment still in effect, right? I mean, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. But you see, that's where you've got to be really careful because now our own sinful natures are sitting there going, well, at least we're here. Aren't we good, Dad? We have taken a commandment and twisted it so that it proves how much better we are than others. Our concupiscent reason is at work here. God leaves it up to us as to what our desires may be on our day to, to do on our day off. We are in a state of holiness by such natural reasoning that puts us in a class all by ourselves. Now I'm going to point out It's good that we have a weekend. Everybody works for it, at least that's how the song goes. You gotta take a break. And the strange thing is, God recognizes our need for a breather. Science has so, in its research, said this, there will always be more things to push off our to-do list, but trading productivity for things that we deeply value is well worth it. The rewards of a life, here it is, live more fully in connection with ourselves and those that matter most to us can act as the best incentive for reclaiming our work, our weekend. Surprise, dear Christian, God thinks exactly the same way. <laughs> you get to trust your creator fully agrees with that assessment. Which is why long before Moses ever came down from Sinai with that third commandment, God had already provided his own example all the way back to creation. That we, created in his image, can then mirror. Having completed a whole integrated creation.
creation, the cosmological forces harmonized in motion together, a perfect environment bursting with flora and fauna, humanity set in responsibilities of being its caretaker, and by so doing that, creation's fruits come back to us to take care of us. And then after all of that, six days of work, God says he rested. A celebration reveling in the perfect relationship between the Creator and all of His creation. And setting a weekly festivity of freeing up humanity to hang out with God and then each other. To make the day a tribute of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord for the gift of this blessed existence and living in a symbiotic spiritual connectedness to Him and to each other. But I say all that to simply reveal the obvious tragedy of mankind's sinful inheritance to twist that whole concept of now Sabbath as a day of rest into a matter of satisfying me time. We can become still enslaved to our old Adam and Eve as to, to take the gift of time off God has provided, time off from worldly routines and daily chores, and make it into whatever satiates our biological needs and gratifies our psychological necessities so that we can feel more connected to ourselves. So we can binge on being with those who matter most to us. If that isn't the definition of an unholy rest, I don't know what is. To try and be more connected to yourself? What kind of sinful selfishness is that? And sets into motion the obvious unhealthy paradox to make two days of the week time spent with those who matter most to us. Well, what does that make the people who you spend the rest of the five days of the week? How many of you are looking forward to going back to work in the, work, in the, in the workplace tomorrow? Dealing with the same gap. Yeah, not me. Why? Got to deal with those people again. You feel it? That's exactly what the Satan wants us to fall into that temptation. We're misusing God's day of rest for ourselves in our own sinful ways that gratifies our old Adam and Eve and our fleshly needs, which is why we need the Lord to come to us this morning on this divinely established Sabbath and grant us renewed faith in the crucified and risen Lord of the Sabbath. He's the one making this day what it is for us. Remember the, the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. We're not here to make it holy, but to keep it holy because the one who first made it holy was the one who died and rose for us. Not for the day, but for each of us. His cross and open tomb reveals this loving promise as how connected God is to us. Starting with his incarnation, his birth in the major, the three years of his ministry, whatever the human condition was, Christ is God with those whom he walks with and those whom he meets. However painful or lonely, the promise is God establishes himself with the weak and the helpless. The testament of his own sufferings and miseries, being betrayed and abandoned. His cross and death bears witness, our God's love to be with us remains steadfast. Calvary executes all those fleshly judgments of God forsaking us in our self-inflicted miseries today. We may have been targets of others' vicious and cruel depravities in the past six days, hapless victims of natural disasters, 
or shooting ourselves in the foot or some man-made catastrophe. This morning we celebrate God is still with us. He remains connected with us in it all. The resurrection of God's incarnate word speaks to our hearts. We're always going to be connected to him. He rose and he ascended and now lives so that his Holy Spirit of loving grace and merciful forgiveness becomes the soundtrack of our lives of faith. I was here on Thursday night for the preschool graduation. Sometime before Pastor Kaloop and I left, the fireworks were going off over at Morton. And there were police cars, at least seven or eight of them, parked on Harlem. I'm going, what is that all about? I mean, they were celebrating graduation. The fireworks, the pyrotechnics of spirituality are going off this morning for God's people. The relationship he has established for us in the waters of holy baptism. Adopting us as his own. Growing and developing into genuine children of God throughout the years. Born of his grace and mercy so that our lives can be born along by that grace and mercy day after day. Anything that tries to sever us from God with us or separate us from God washed away again and again in that irrevocable claim that he placed upon us. We put it over here in the front, positioning it with a place of honor. But you got to think maybe more importantly and appropriately to celebrate its true promise of how we came into the kingdom of God. We got to stick it back there in the doorway. Or maybe put it here in the middle of the, of the congregation so that every week it becomes another firework going up. Hey, I didn't become a member of God's church because I decided that. Nothing so plain and ordinary. You're a child of God because your Heavenly Father loves you, claims you as His own. Boom! Oh, I'm sorry. A dignity we in our sinful natures may be tempted to forget. A calling our old Adam and Eve throughout the week, rounding us down, may try to undermine. A nobility of our selfish cravings that we try and often to face and disfigure by saying, ah, we don't need a church today. Yet here in this place, The Lord of the Sabbath's promise continues to raise us up and call us into his presence. This is the Sabbath day where his words and deeds are proclaimed and we can rest in the compassionate reassurance, reviving our expectation. God, you're going to be with us this coming week. Our faults are pardoned, our weaknesses will not be held against us. It's a whole new journey of putting behind us the world's insinuations. And we're not good enough for it. Yeah, okay, fine, you're right. Maybe not. But well, we're good enough for our Heavenly Father, and He has made us His ambassadors and emissaries to the world. I'd explode again here, but once again. Forget the word. He's made His connection in baptism. He continues that in his word as we meditate on it, as we hear it proclaimed, and one more time to rebuke those suspicions that somehow or other God is not with us. He says, come here, take and eat, take and drink. This is my body, this is my blood. My real presence is here for you. Come rest your hearts, refresh your souls. I'm taking the time to make this place where we can just sit down and commune with each other to embed himself in our hearts and that we can be the embodiment of his presence to the world. <clears throat> I can simply say, you're doing yourself a whole lot of good by being in this place this morning. That is God's blessing. But then, 
we'd probably be no better than those Pharisees that all they cared about was doing themselves good to the point where, you know, you're not going to actually be like that, are you? Because then you break the law. Do you realize how much good you're doing for the world out there? By your witness of making time to be here this morning. People may complain about worship services go on because the sermons are too long. I always say, you know, an hour and a half in church. He was three hours on the cross. What are you complaining about? But I'm not here to inflict guilt. What I'm trying to say is, he showed how much worth you are to him by dying for those three hours. How worthy can we show him he is to us by our willingness to sacrifice our time, <coughs> our tithes, our talents, and our skills to make this place a fireworks of God's grace and mercy to the world. And they can be invited in to watch the show and light a few of those firecrackers themselves by their own faith in the crucified and risen Lord. <clears throat> Trusting in this Christ, there is no me time. There's only us time. Him and us. Together, always, forever. Celebrating word and sacrament makes this day a holiday from the world, a holy day commemorating his dying and rising again, whereby he's established us to be his own. This crucified and risen Lord of the Sabbath has made us for this time, this place, to rest. So that we can go out and exercise the liberty of being citizens of his kingdom in all that we say and do during this coming week. This congregation has spent a hundred years celebrating that. God willing, we'll have another hundred. Of course, maybe not. <clears throat> but when he comes again, we won't worry about that. Yeah, time being short. We'll be able to look forward to all the eternity that's we're going to be together. So with a nod to Abraham Lincoln, by trust and hope in Christ, we dedicate ourselves to the unfinished work of bringing God's kingdom near to the world, to the neighbors of Berwyn, to those who live on our streets. Resolved in his dying and rising again for us, be not in vain. So devoted that this weekly day is one more new birth of spiritual freedom. That God's kingdom of grace alone, solely through faith and only in Christ, shall not perish from this earth, but endure to life everlasting. Amen. <laughs> the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.